Okay, dear all, we are here to start. And as you see, uh, this is a very extensive title actually on the screen. And we when we were designing uh, our program for the scientific seminars, we decided that yes, why not to do that? Because we had this idea uh, quite a long time ago and we have a wonderful data set to work with. But I would say that overall, we a little bit overestimated our capabilities. And besides, if we go back to the idea of the research purpose, the research goal, and when you try to work with different tools, definitely you try to narrow to the tools you're going to use uh, and your methodology you're going to use. So here we have a long list of different um, software programs, different tools to use. Uh, they are very diverse. I will talk about some of them and I will also provide probably some comments and links where you can also go and use and study and test yourself because uh, the packages, I would say, and opportunities for network analysis are very diverse. And here it is up to the researcher how to approach this idea to work with specific data sets with the existing uh, research purposes. Um, okay, so yes, here, let's start. So in the first place, um, a little bit of theory. If you have been attending our summer school this year, this summer, I already did a short talk about uh, using Voss Viewer for bibliographic research. And I will start, because we have uh, people here with different background, I will start a little bit with some information, some theory. So uh, why we do that and why it is important. So here we come across different terms. I think you have heard a lot about scientometrics. You have heard about bibliometrics. You have heard about bibliographic data. But just to be, for all of us, to be on the same page, I will provide very brief overview of the, the approaches and probably the theoretical background just to understand what we're working with and what we are dealing with. So the term scientometric, uh, I am not going to dig deep in the theory. I will just give general overview. So uh, the basic term scientometric that we work with, here I refer to the uh, manual and uh, recommendation of Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And uh, we can very broadly define scientometric uh, research, scientometrics as quantitative study of science, communication and science, and science policy. So basically from the root of this word, scientometric, it is quite clear. So we have science plus we have metrics. So if we look into different indicators, we see that overall the scientific production of different publications, patents, citations has been growing over the recent years. Uh, here we see the example also from OECD uh, data source calculations based on uh, some databases, we see the output of scientific production. And there is the major objective, how to deal with that, how to measure, how to assess performance. I think many or organizations and Russian universities, Russian academic institutions are not an exception. They're also in search of the best metrics to measure scientific output of the organizations. So here we have um, an example of the scoreboard OECD for science, technology, and industry. So basically, scientific production and metrics of scientific production, they are on national and international uh, importance. And there are international guidelines also how to approach different metrics generated in the area of scientific production. Uh, for example, here we have an example of uh, such guidelines on bibli bibliometrics science indicators. So here we talk about scientific publication output, uh, scientific publication indicators by field of science, scientific publication indicators by sectors. So this basically also about measuring national and international scientific output. And this becomes probably the corner 
uh, piece of uh, some national statistics as well, how to integrate that, how to account for that, and how to consider that. There are numerous journals devoted to very large area. For example, here you see quite an outstanding distinguished journal, Science Metrics, uh, and a simple screenshot of the publications related to scientific production. So when we move a little bit closer to some metrics, uh, if you are not a specialist in this area, you may come across different types of metrics. For example, here we see such a term as bibliometrics, infometrics, and science metrics. Science metrics is science of science, bibliometrics, library science, and infometrics, information science. Uh, so we refer in general to bibliometrics as the field uh, of library science, right? And science metrics, it is more likely to be about process of managing scientific activities, how to evaluate them and how to predict them. If you dig a little bit deeper, you will find diversity of terms, including uh, web metrics, alt metrics as alternative metrics measuring uh, this uh, production. So probably here, that is uh, what is interesting in this area to distinguish the terms for the analysis. Uh, for example, here I have a reference to a publication where researchers try to compare science metrics, infometrics, and bibliometrics, how they are different and how they are similar. So they came up to such uh, a conclusion that these three metrics, they differ in subject background and they vary in the degrees of utilization and recognition, but they share similar theories, methods, and technologies. And also the conclusion, they say that we recommend the um, addition of bibliometrics in the title of the International Society for Science Metrics and Infometrics. So I do not know whether this organization is going to follow these recommendations, but anyway, in terms of result of uh, study, right, uh, research, uh, project. This is quite an interesting conclusion, and this also marks the importance of bibliometric research. So what we need uh, here in our case, right, uh, we need bibliographic data. So what is bibliographic data? This is information needed to identify and retrieve a publication. And here we have all different elements like authors, titles, publisher, place of publication, date, journal type, and so on and so forth, right? And here we need some bibliographic database, which represent organized collection of different references, or we can call uh, metadata about different publications that we are going to analyze. So bibliographic data uh, to refer to the kind of metadata, such as metadata to be found in some catalogs, uh, databases uh, about the publications. Uh, we have diverse databases. This is quite understandable, but still, there are two major databases as Web of Science and Scopus. And here I have a reference to a publication where the author called the titans of bibliographic information today in the academic world. Today, yes, we understand that there are some limitations, but nevertheless, if we look for current, the most recent publications, we still see that a lot of people, even here in Russia, they keep doing analysis of data retrieved from Web of Science, Scopus, despite existing limitations. Uh, for our study, we also use Web of Science information and the data that we retrieved there, so probably many um, scientific teams, they still work on their previously retrieved information. So we have a very large data set we work with and uh, we are going to continue to work. There are different ways to get this information with the limitations. Some people ask their colleagues, international colleagues who go abroad, for example, and can download this information. So we are not discussing these limitations. So simply I couldn't actually 
uh, show you, but very generally it is possible to retrieve. So when you have access to this database, uh, you can retrieve the necessary information and there are many guidelines also how to do that. Uh huh. So we have a comment from Daria. <laughs> uh, I will advertise our work uh, on so-called iMetrics, yes. So here, uh, I didn't advertise previously some publications of our team, but uh, it is also possible to get some recommendations. So moving on closer to what we are going to do and what we are going to need. So when we say bibliometric analysis, basically we can talk about some descriptive statistics. So it is possible to find some publications where you see some counts, shares, see some trends based on those quantitative measures, right? So we can call it descriptive statistics. And also uh, there are some types of works using network analysis, doing network bibliometric analysis. So for the tools that we need to do going beyond databases, uh, I would say that we have this formula, right? So we need to have some descriptive statistics. Uh, we need to know uh, some specifics of bibliometrics and this area. And we uh, have to have the tools to do uh, network analysis. Uh, here you see an example, bibliometric analysis, this descriptive one, as I mentioned, uh, one of the most recent publications, it was published in August this year. So this August, so we're not far away from that. Um, this publication is in Russian, but I put here the name, uh, current positions and trends in the international cooperation of Russian researchers basing on web of science data. And on the right, you see this pie chart where you see basically uh, the shares of publications uh, basing on the countries in web of science uh, for four years. But there is another the approach that we are using uh, so we may build some networks and here we have an example this project we are working on uh, we are working on um, international collaborations of Russian scientists and today I am going to use the example of Russian scientists international collaborations in sociology this is the work that uh, we are trying to complete and also we are trying to publish uh, pretty soon uh, also being very general if we talk about types of bibliometric networks here I put a screenshot of different types, uh, a very short description. So we can talk about networks and types of analysis, co-authorship analysis. So here we look at the relatedness of items determined on the number of co-author documents. And we can do this analysis for authors, so we co-authorship authors, we can talk about organizations, and we can look at the countries. Then uh, it is co-occurrence analysis. Here we have relatedness of items based on their um, items, how they appear together in the documents. Then we have citation analysis. So in in um, uh, in this analysis, analysis. Uh, that is about number of times that uh, documents cite each other, also cite each other. Uh, bibliographic coupling. Uh, here we look at the references and co-citation analysis. So how uh, items uh, are cited together. So that is very briefly. There are some specifics, but uh, in order to understand what we are going to move on and discuss, we'll talk about co-authorship, co-occurrence, and citation a little bit. And uh, I wanted to show this picture many times during different seminars. So that is about bibliometric analysis and building networks. So this may, uh, not far away from Moscow, uh, there is such a museum and place called New Jerusalem. And there was a really wonderful exhibition of Flemish art. Uh, and here you see the announcement so this uh, exhibition is uh, finished right now, uh, but I took a picture of the Flemish paintings and uh, actually the museum did quite a great work to arrange uh, these 
um, artists, uh, painters as a network. And here we see different types of connections. So this is just a part of the picture. Uh, in yellow, these are links indicating uh, teachers and students who was teacher, who was a student. So here we see this type of link, this type of connection. Um, white one, this is the family connection. So who is the relative to whom? And finally, the black one, so probably that one was one of my favorite, uh, that is about co-authors. So who painted paintings with whom together? So basically oh. we can, yes, <laughs> we can talk about co-authorship. Oops, sorry. So we have someone talking. Yes. Just a second. Uh-huh, thank you. So this is a picture of co-authorship uh, of Flemish artists. So that I found it very exciting and I tried to show to use this picture sometime before, but that was not the case. So I think uh, here, this is quite a good illustration. Example of co-authorship network of Flemish artists. Um, quite an inspiration for us to use different on different tools was a publication. We have this publication in our Telegram channel, both for MASNA master program and our channel, um, laboratory channel nodes and links. Uh, it was quite some time ago, but if you're interested, you can go and just uh, try to, for example, use the word LinkedIn and you will find uh, this publication or uh, Veronica Espinosa or some words from this uh, post. So yes, um, this post was done by Veronica Espinosa and it is published on LinkedIn where uh, she described how she compared different network visualization tools. So here we have, um, I think 12 examples and from those examples, definitely, we had already sessions on Gephi and they are available on our YouTube. Um, we use Orange uh, in our program. So this Orange tool, uh, it is also possible to use. Uh, we use the graphics stream and we use both viewer. There are diversity of tools, but probably for the purpose of your research, you will come up with a limited number of solutions because definitely it is not possible to master everything. Uh, but at least I enumerated some of them that we use and it is very easy to... Uh, so I I, will, I guess uh, Veronica didn't test Pyek. So yes, uh, she didn't test many of them. Uh, here, I just wanted to show the diversity of network visualization tools, which are accessible to everyone. And actually it is possible to do some simple visualization using even traditional SPSS. Maybe it requires some additional module uh, to be installed and paid for, but many statistical programs, they have this module where you can do some visualization of networks. But the question is whether they are all suitable for bibliometric analysis. So remember, I talked about specifics. Well, anyway, today I will mention some more programs and show you some examples. Uh, here I want to refer to the publication, uh, quite a recent one of um, co-authors who did analysis of software tools for conducting bibliometric analysis and science, an up-to-date review. So this publication dates from 2020, but I think it is still very, very urgent. And uh, I do not think that too many things changed since that. What I liked here that they try to analyze the application of different tools, not just by enumerating different programs. So we have the programs, so let's just test them. So they somehow summarized into four different groups. Uh, they talked about databases that allow downloading bibliographic data and they compared some of them. Then they talked about bibliometric software, which allows to produce some indices and do some performance analysis. Then they have this group of SMA. So this is science mapping analysis tools, SMA tools. And also as a separate category, they have R and Python. 
libraries specifically. So I will mention um, different tools, but uh, I would actually advise to go through this publication, a very nice one. And it has also examples of different visualizations of those SMA tools that I will not be able to show today, definitely. Um, this is uh, the table with the characteristics of databases. So here we have uh, Web of Science and Scopus. Uh, the comparison, subscription, data download, record limits, whether it is possible not to use API formats, and so on and so forth. And here we come to a more interesting part, characteristics of those science mapping analysis tools. And probably if you're doing bibliometric research, you are already acquainted with some of those tools. So here we see uh, version, year, of introduction, right, of a specific package or program, uh, uh, operation system, developer, and how you can use that. Uh, from this list, I am going to refer today to Biblia Shiny. So we use the uh, Bibliometrics Biblia Shiny in R. And when I will show you some visualizations, I will also comment from which specific tool we produced such a visualization. And we are going to use Voice Viewer. And we have Pike, which is not here uh, on the list, but nevertheless, it doesn't mean that it is less important. Uh, this table from the publication gives us the comparison of all those elements, whether a specific bibliometric software tool may produce uh, and have some specific maps uh, and whether a specific tool has the functionality like thematic network, author network, reference network, some other networks, uh, birth detection, performance, geospatial, for example. So, for example, Orange can do this geospatial map, like uh, mapping on the uh, ge geographical map, right? And here we have the comparisons. We have those crosses and we see also uh, some explanations for visualizations. Quite a nice publication and I think it is mm, uh, a very comprehensive one. Uh, coming up to the analysis. So when we choose a tool, uh, we have our research process. I liked the structure, this workflow of scientific mapping. So when you try to do uh, some scientific maps, you follow some procedure. So in this publication, Bibliometric Analysis of Visualizations in Computer Graphics Study, uh, the publication produced uh, by the authors from University of Ljubljana, not our colleagues from University of Ljubljana, but also uh, researchers working in the same institutions. And they split the analysis process from data retrieval to interpretation. Because if you do some scientific work, right, you will need to interpret it somehow. If you visualize some data, so what is the purpose? Why you want to do that? Uh, for example, there are some wonderful visualizations, but they are meaningless. For example, for my data set, I tried uh, in Biblia Shiny to build three field plots. This is a very beautiful sun key di diagram, right? So it is very nice. But with the data I had, it is absolutely meaningless and doesn't have any power for interpretation. So here we decide how to move. But first, definitely, we start with the research purpose. And this is quite a nice algorithm. We see how we move from the research purpose up to interpretation. And we have the very important part, data sources and retrieval strategy. Then we have pre-processing. This is quite uh, quite a pain, I would say, for people who work with uh, large data sets. Then network extraction, normalization, mapping analysis, and so on. And every stage in this algorithm deserves a discussion, actually. But, I will just move on. So right now, coming closer to our project, uh, we have a very large project running right now. We call it Web of Science Russia. We had a chance to get information uh, before Web of Science decided not to have um, institutional access uh, in our country. Uh, so we 
run with the data set that we retrieved last year. Uh, and a little bit about the project. So we tried to analyze, uh, I would say, international dimension of collaborations of Russian scientists. In our data set, we have uh, quite an extensive number of publications, uh, but overall, we call it the study of the Russian science. The overall data set has over 1 million publications. And when we download this information from Web of Science, uh, we have this plain text files, and we see some elements, uh, authors, affiliations, uh, their uh, author, uh, corresponding author, institutions, uh, lists of references, because here we had the entire full information. Uh, we have talked a lot about this project. I'm not going to stop uh, here. The description, this is our international project running and we have support from our collaborator, from international collaborator. So uh, we hope that we will continue to have access to Web of Science data. But anyway, whatever we have here, and we decided since the data set is really huge and the idea to analyze the entire data set is absolutely wonderful, but uh, it is impossible to approach so many publications at once. So we decided to eat an elephant in chunks, elephant or a whale, and to eat an elephant in chunks to move step by step. And we decided to explore the data set with the subset in sociology. Uh, we extracted almost 8,000 publications from our large data set. So we have this subset in sociology. Uh, we, we would say that uh, initially this project was data driven, but there are many, many research questions actually behind this uh, data. Um, actually, uh, how we generated this subset. Uh, in Web of Science, there are several research areas. So they call it research area as CS uh, attributed to every single publication. Uh, some publications may have three, four research areas attributed, and some publications may have up to nine. I think this was the largest uh, number of SCs attributed to specific publications. So we form this data set if at least one uh, research category attributed to a publication was sociology. So if we formulate uh, for uh, different subsets, then one single publication may fall within uh, different uh, subsets. But here we are interested in subset in sociology only. So we decided, yes, we decided initially to use two software tools, both Viewer and Pyek. Uh, but finally, we also came up to the conclusion that we are going to use uh, library bibliometrics with their app BiblioShiny, that is for R, right? And uh, if uh, Pyek requires, well, actually, I would say any software requires understanding of some underlying algorithms, what you're going to build. So it is not simply trying to push the buttons and generate some research output. So you need to understand how the process goes on. Uh, but with Pyek, probably uh, you will need more, mm, I wouldn't say, coding experience, but understanding how it works, because this package uh, deals statistically with the data set. Uh, PIEC for such a data set retrieved from Web of Science requires some additional module, was to PIEC. So to transfer and prepare data for analysis in PIEC, you need also to use uh, was, was, was to PIEC module. And you need to understand how to generate uh, different networks, uh, which procedures to use. So probably this package is the most uh, knowledge intensive, I would say. 
So Voss viewer is uh, rather simple, but for people who are specialists in bibliometric analysis, uh, Voss viewer works usually as a black box because uh, sometimes you do not understand what is going on inside. So sometimes you need to guess or study additionally because uh, despite the fact that the manual is for 70 pages, it is still black box. And Biblia Shiny, it is very easy to use. So you use R, you uh, install packages, you install uh, Biblia metrics, uh, you run this library, and then you start Biblia Shiny, which opens like pops up in the browser in a window. And this app, as it is called, the app is developed um, and is called like no coders app. So it is very to use, it is easy to use, it is very intuitive, uh, but it also allows to work with the data, it allows uh, to clean the data. Well, just, just a quick remark also uh, on uh, these three different packages. So uh, um, for voice viewer, it is possible, if you have a small data set, it is possible to pre-process your data using thesauruses. Uh, you can create uh, in a text file a simple thesaurus label with replaced by uh, if the data set is not large, a small one. Uh, but if it is large, you need to do something else. So for our data set, we use some procedures in Python to pre-process the data and um, uh, still um, this data pre-processing for the data set, we continue to work uh, with manual. Uh, pre-processing, like finalize this uh, file, these corrections manually. Pike works statistically. So actually this statistical approach allows also to remove duplicates. Also to, sometimes it is manually necessary to introduce some procedures to merge some notes when you have, for example, similar names, but you know that this is the same author. So you will, a little bit later, you'll understand what I'm talking about because I'm going to show you examples. Uh, but this package itself allows you to uh, at least prepare some data for analysis. Uh, in Biblia Shiny, it is also possible. Uh, actually, the program creates data frame. Uh, you can work with the, this data frame and also pre-process um, data, clean it, and work further on. Uh, overall, uh, was your and Pyek, so these two programs, was viewer was uh, created in the uh, Netherlands and Leiden University by the researchers specifically for bibliometric research. Uh, uh, there are a lot of publications how to work with uh, their program, a lot of, uh, quite an extensive manual. And uh, overall, the program is intuitive, except for one, uh, except for one exception, that it is still looks like a blocks, black box model. So Pyek also, this is an open program. You can easily download that. We have uh, a lot of, I would say, uh, educational videos about this program and manuals available, uh, but uh, it is a little bit more complicated to work with Pyek. And Biblia Shine itself, if you move on to this program, uh, also available online, free, no payment, very easy to use. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the project itself. So what we got and about some networks. So here you see uh, the first picture from uh, Voice Viewer generated for co-authorship networks. Um, initially, this is a raw file, not pre-processed data. We see that we have the field of researchers, this visualization, and we see that this is quite a fragmented one. But I would like to pay your attention here that we have here almost uh, 8,500 authors. And we see a table, uh, the names, this, uh, this was the top authors. The names do not repeat each other, but at least you can see some inconsistency, how these names are written. So that was initially generated in was viewer. So if you work with raw data, probably you will come across this problem. But for this data set, there are numerous pre-processing problems. 
So because many publications, they were in Russian language and they were transformed into Latin form using different approaches. This is how you write um, in the name um, in English, how you would write this name in French, like uh, some sounds, letters, you, or you, uh, their last name could be the same, but it could be written by different journals in English and integrated then in Web of Science in this shape, form, and so on and so forth. So that is quite a problematic question. And if we think that uh, Web of Science gives us a terrific, almost clean data set, that is not true. So this is a visualization from Pike uh, that was generated with <laughs> raw data. And definitely we see here some problems. So when we see those diets, we see like Andre. Okay, great. So, uh, sorry. So here we see the description uh, generated automatically by their app, right? And we see that what we got: metadata, authors, document title, uh, to total citation, excellent. Information, publication year, corresponding author, affiliation, good. Then cited reference is acceptable. Abstract poor. Um, digital object identificators, critical, keywords, keywords plus, plus critical. So we have this data set from 1991 to uh, 2000, uh, 2022, uh, 30 years. Uh, we would suggest that probably this um, critical part and completeness of the data is due either some specific journals, some specific sources, or some specific types of publications. Probably some types of publications do not require, but still. Or maybe that was about some publications in 90s uh, which didn't have full, complete metadata. So this is what we have. Uh, over the description, for 30 years, we have seen number of source, source, sources, we see number of authors, and we uh, see that uh, Biblia Shiny generated uh, from this uh, raw data file, uh, obviously merged some authors already because number of authors is smaller than it was originally. We see a negative annual growth rate, probably not critical, but still. Uh, but for international collaborations, uh, quite an interesting figure here is international co-authorship, which is actually not very large. Uh, and we have here quite a significant amount of single authored documents. And on the left, this is their line graph uh, publications uh, from year to year. And on the right, this is an interesting one, affiliations production over time. Uh, we understand that there are some large institutions producing sociological research in Russia. And the red line graph, this is uh, Institute of Sociology, Russian Academy of Sciences. And we see steady growth right from 1992. Uh, but in terms of the universities, this is uh, not all the universities. This is from the top here, now National Research Unif and National Research High School of Economics, actually the same institution, but in two forms. Uh, so uh, that is the data which was not reprocessed. But anyway, we see that universities, leaders of publications, they started growing somewhere at the end of 
to years 2000 or early uh, 2010, so probably uh, 2011, 2012, uh, and we see this steady growth for universities. So overall, Russian Academy of Sciences uh, steady growth over the whole period of time and universities, uh, more recent growth, and here we can discuss science policy, right? We can talk about university funding and different programs and so on. Here we can see. Uh, I have a reference here to a publication uh, from 2018 uh, when authors analyzed trends in Russian research output. So actually this graph is for um, all collaborations uh, in all scientific disciplines. But we see that national collaboration, so maybe as a trend for Russian research, national collaborations, they grow steadily over time, but international collaborations, they steadily decrease. And this is not the case of the last two, three, or four years. Another recent publication, I have already referred to this one, uh, international collaborations of Russian uh, researchers. Uh, we also see that uh, the number of publication is growing and a uh, number of international co-authorship is growing. So here, um, but this one was done for 2018, 2022. So we will, I think, use these uh, two publications as a benchmark to compare, but they have different uh, period of time and also they have a little bit different sources they analyze, but they have a uh, web of science as well. Um, two publications uh, about all disciplines taken together. In terms of our data set, if we consider international collaborations, uh, the data set was generated if uh, the publication was attributed to Russia. So if uh, the specific field indicated, CU field indicated uh, Russia, but when we analyze the data set itself, uh, overall 8,000 publications. So we counted here uh, Russian language publications, almost 85%. So if these publications are in Russian, who is the reader of those publications, despite the fact that they are indexed in uh, international database uh, web of science. Uh, number of publications in English, only slightly over 15%. There are some other languages, but it is absolutely insignificant number. Uh, here, the main interest is the uh, language of the publications, Russian and English. So right now, let's talk a little bit about exploring the data. The data might look uh, as a respect from a res respectful <laughs> data source uh, as quite um, uh, good, clean, and transparent, but everyone faces the problems. So when we look at the data set, we see that, um, especially if we consider that a lot of publications are done in Russian, so. What problems could be when we translate, transliterate the names of the authors in English, this could be such a problem. It could be last name plus name and patronymic, just first names of name, or first letters of name and patronymic. It could be just last name and full first name, like Raman, right? It could be... Um, last name, full first name, and first letter of the patronymic name. Or even uh, it is such a case for those publications when in the first place comes patronymic. Is uh, uh, Valerievich Radaev V. So uh, the patronymic is instead of the last name. So this is quite, quite a problem. And this three different writings of one name. This is disambiguity of their last names, first names and patronymic names gives us that this is such a situation when we have, instead of one author, we have 
three authors. And I try to illustrate in this picture. So here, almost in gray, we see the entire visualization of the data set. And um, Barsukova Svetlana was written either with name plus patronymic, or in some cases, Barsukova Svetlana with the first full name. Two different authors, and that significantly impacts the visualization of this network. Uh, also, some problematic areas. Uh, Russian letter Yo can be written, Kruhmaleva, Kruhmalova. Uh, some complicated letters as J, Sh. Uh, for example, we see here that Alihadjiva, it is J or Z H, right? Different ways. Um, Vadim Radaev in on the left. So we had, I think, seven or even more uh, options of the name written. Um, uh, and on the right, we have uh, the same author. I I think it was ten plus um, options of the. Uh, last name written. Uh, one more question, quite an important one, that uh, in Web of Science, accidentally or incidentally, uh, independent scholar or independent researcher um, is interpreted probably as a missing value. In the publications, so we see that a person is indicated as an independent scholar or independent researcher, but there is no such uh, mark in web of science or the problem also was with some uh, commercial organizations as yandex uh, in web of science in the metadata this information also was missing um it is difficult to say uh, why independent scholars researchers or uh, commercial organizations they are considered as organizations so uh, in the publications it was not missing, but in Web of Science, these fields were missing. Like these authors had no affiliation, but instead of affiliation, they simply had addresses of uh, the places. Uh, right now, some visualizations uh, from different programs. So, and I will provide some explanations. So here we see authors of this sociological uh, data set on the left. Uh, their full map of the authors with the threshold of five publications. Uh, we see some major component, uh, general connected component, and on the right, uh, it is the, uh, this component itself. So probably this is the largest connected component, uh, including in it all general uh, pro prominent uh, authors. Uh, when we compare the descriptive statistics for authors from Web of Science and PIKE, we see that probably some values, and here we, we may talk about number of the documents, number of the publications, they may differ slightly, may differ a little bit. So that was also after cleaning the data. So this could be due to some uh, algorithms in the programs or maybe some still missing, not clean data uh, in the data set. Uh, but definitely uh, clean data set is very important. Also, when we try to choose which programs to use, probably we should uh, go back and rely on the research purpose. I have a reference here uh, from an outstanding research in centimetric from the Netherlands, Lud Leisdorf, and his co-authors, who used both uh, both viewer and Pike together these programs, uh, trying to decide which specific algorithm and for what case for which a research task to use. Uh, these programs are fully compatible, so uh, you can generate the necessary files and analyze in different. Uh, programs. For example, if we go back here to this map, here we see the overall map and the major connected component. Uh, for example, in PIEC, um, it was possible to generate using this islands approach 
And uh, Daria, when she generated such uh, a visualization, she said, I am quite a surprised. It looks like I do not know those authors well. But when we move on and uh, work together with another program, it becomes very obvious. So here uh, I have the output from VOS Viewer. So this is the statistics for organizations. We have number of the documents, so we can sort using the number of the documents. We can sort according to number of citations and also to the metric used uh, in VOS Viewer as total link strength. And total link strength overall shows the strength uh, of uh, the links of a specific node, of a specific organization. So probably this is about connectivity, integration in the network. And if we sort according to total link strengths, we see that uh, there are some universities from the southern part of Russia, from Caucasus, and in VOS viewer visualization, uh, despite the fact that these universities like um, Chechen State University, um, then we have Chechen State Pedagogical University, they do not have a lot of publications or a lot of citations. But in terms of the connection in the network, they stay included. They do not fall outside. They do not fall into isolate. So they are included. And here we have, so I try to highlight somehow pictures uh, where we see how those universities are connected. Uh, for organizations, authorship of organizations, here we see a general visualization from VOS Viewer. Uh, if we use just one single publication um, as a threshold, so we want to see all the organizations who published something uh, over 30 years. So we see in their center this uh, visualization. Definitely there is the core and there is a periphery, some universities standing apart. On the right, I put also uh, small pictures because uh, if you try to enlarge and if you try to uh, explore in detail, it looks like Russian Academy of Sciences and High School of Economics, uh, they are two largest and most productive organizations. Here, yeah, just a quick remark that we tried also not to analyze organizations according to different departments, schools, institutes, and campuses. So we have rather small, well, it is large data set, right? But it is rather small compared to some other research fields because uh, if we check physics or mathematics, uh, they have in our large data set uh, 300,000 publications. So we try to play with uh, sociological data set and I would call those small organizations, I don't know why, but uh, as a metaphor, I, I started thinking like uh, some like pocket organizations closely connected to uh, their organization in Russia and they cooperate only with this organization, maybe occasionally. But if we set such a threshold of one publication for 30 years, that is right, that is quite a surprising because that is not about productivity, that is not about stability of cooperation or anything like that. If we set at least um, uh, Uh, Alina, I will come back to the questions a little bit later. So uh, here, uh, here, here we have just the first affiliation. So here it is the first affiliation included. Uh, we uh, couldn't split for uh, several affiliations. So if we have an author who is included, uh, he's included, he or she is included with the first affiliation. So for the second affiliation, no, that is quite... I think a complicated question. And uh, so it is something to reflect on. So here we have the first affiliation indicated uh, by the author. Uh, if we analyze organizations further and set a threshold of five documents, five publications, we have such a picture. But the question, five publications in 30 years, is it enough or not enough? Well, but that is the reality. That is as the data set as it is. Uh, on the left, 
we also have core and periphery, pretty similar picture, but a cleaner one. And on the right, so that is something uh, more clear, we see two largest organizations and also some other, mainly from Moscow and St. Petersburg. So here we see how the network is built and how it is connected. Uh, coming up to the countries, overall in our data set, we have 63 collaborating countries for 30 years, if it is just one publication. But if it is at least five publications, only 27 countries fall within this um, visualization. So this is also produced from Voss Viewer, and we see we can talk about probably traditional cooperation with the countries, international collaborations, and maybe some new geography for collaborations. Uh, in yellow uh, and um, light green and yellow color indicates uh, chronologically younger collaborations and uh, bluish color that is about traditional or so-called old collaborations. But if we try to visualize all the countries collaborating with the Russian sociologists, uh, we would probably split these types of collaboration into uh, collaboration between two countries. That is clearly on the right side of the picture and multilateral collaborations. Uh, and here we have the question, uh, if those multilateral collaborations, right? When uh, a country, if you have collaborators from a specific country, probably you would have more opportunities, uh, quite a higher potential for extending international collaborations. But it is quite clear. Uh, I do agree here that one publication in 30 years is not enough, but at least we can distinguish this bilateral, bilateral and probably multilateral, multilateral collaborations. Um, the citation analysis, we have a uh, doubtless leader here. So that is the journal Sociologiczki Sledovania. Once again, if our data set, it is about 85% uh, of publications written in English. Uh, mostly those are the journals which uh, 85 are written in Russian, mostly are the journals, yes, uh, which are in Russian. Uh, but in terms of the citation, um, there is one outstanding international journal which has not a lot of publications of the Russian uh, scientists, but has quite good citation rank. So that is social indicators research. That is in terms of their citations, the second journal. So the first one still, uh, it is sociological research, sociological исследования and from international journal, social indicators research. So probably that is the top international journal with really good citations. Uh, here we have um, most global cited documents and most local cited documents. These are the visualizations from Biblia Shiny. So this type of analysis is also possible. And finally, I think uh, I will move to uh, co-occurrence analysis. So here we have uh, building bibliographic maps of co-occurrence. That is the co-presence of um, keywords in different publications, pre pre presence, um, joint presence when uh, they come together. Uh, we can do this analysis. So uh, the best one, came up in both viewers. So, and that is what I'm going to show you. So co-occurrence network, uh, the keywords indicated by the authors and overall keywords, if, is, if we set uh, some threshold, we see such a cloud of words. But uh, if we move on and try to distinguish in more details, so here we see that they fall within some thematic clusters. So what uh, themes those international collaborations, Rus Russian sociologists, they explore? So if we play with normalization algorithms, we have from five to six clusters overall. So this is a visualization available in uh, Voss Viewer. 
And Biblia Shiny allows us to generate such an output as trend topics. Uh, we see how term, how specific keyword appeared chronologically in was co-occurring chronologically in different publications. So um, as you see here, this is the output for trend topics for authors keywords. And not surprisingly, we have those trends only for uh, starting from approximately 2008. So probably there is some question, some issue with the keywords uh, for the previous publication. So that was what, what I mentioned before. Um, moving on to uh, clusters. So overall, we see this uh, colorful ball of links. And overall, uh, we have five clusters here. If we explore them thematically, and probably this is something that we could do together, just some interaction. Um, what Russian sociologists, international collaborations of Russian sociologists, what they, which topics they explore. Uh, actually, with our research team, we have already discussed a little bit those thematic clusters, but you also may look uh, at their keywords and try to guess what they uh, what, what they are thematically about. Overall, we have five clusters. So once again, uh, a quick remark here that talking about keywords, this could be problematic, right? So we have the quality of the completeness of bibliographic metadata for keywords is critical, uh, but at least we try to look what uh, sociological community explores or writes about. So this is the first cluster, and I just included some pictures of the nodes, how they are connected from this cluster. Uh, they're um, mostly used keyword. So that is uh, cluster number one. And here we have Russia, sociology, historical sociology, history, ideology, discourse. So overall, a list of 25 items, so we may be surprised why what China is doing there, but probably there is a specific place for China. So if you have some ideas, you may write down in the chat and we could discuss together with you. So this is the first cluster. Uh, the second cluster, it has uh, just a shorter list of words, but here we have inequality, gender, uh, women, children, family, solidarity, health. So uh, this is the second themat thematic cluster. Uh, cluster number three, here we have uh, identity and culture is the most prominent words, I would say, yes. Also modernization, and so on. So yes, I think uh, I'm going to finish here with this uh, thematic cluster. So overall, we try to use uh, three programs with the libraries. Uh, yes, uh, we didn't plan actually to compare Python and our libraries. So we try to think about the software tools that we use for our project. So here we used uh, Voice Viewer, we used Pyke, preprocessing was done in Python, plus we used R, Bibliometrics, and web uh, app, Bibliashiny. So these are the tools that we used, and I think we, we, we are going to move on with uh, them together. Well, uh, I think that for the thematic part, for the topic, of today's uh, presentation, that is it. Uh, I also want very briefly to remind that we still 
um, we still are open for enrollment for our master's program. And in terms of bibliometric analysis and different uh, software tools for network visualizations, once again, uh, we can talk about programs in general, and we can talk about programs uh, which aim specifically for bibliomet bibliometric analysis, network bibliometric analysis. Uh, in our study plan, we have introduction to network analysis where we work with our we have advanced network analysis methods where we work with PIEC. Uh, we have statistical methods of social network analysis where we work with R. And we have diversity of tools which are used in research seminars. PIEC, was viewer, was to PIEC, uh, we are using in for research seminars. Uh, GEFI is also used in introduction to network analysis. And I think uh, one more course, uh, contemporary data analysis, methodology and methods of interdisciplinary research. Uh, Orange, yes, last but not least, uh, we use Orange uh, for data mining course. And also, as I mentioned, it has the functionality for um, network visualizations. And one course I almost forgot about, this is social network analysis with R, uh, which is devoted purely to work in R. So yes, I think I will finish here. Thank you very much. Yes, probably questions. Mm -hmm. Alina, thank you. Uh, take home message. Um, well, if we, um, um, which program on which step of analysis or research to use? Uh, it is possible actually to work just with one tool. So it is possible to work with R and the libraries in R. So it is possible. Uh, it is possible to use just Bibliometrics plus BibliaShiny or only was viewer. For example, uh, I referred to one publication today with this algorithm for bibliometric research. The authors uh, used uh, was viewer only, but I'm not sure that they limited. They were limited uh, to was viewer while they were doing data preprocessing. So I'm not sure about that. But quite commonly in the publications, uh, we see that at least a couple of tools were used by different researchers. So it is possible to use just single uh, software program. So yes, but probably sometimes uh, it is necessary to test some additional programs to increase the functionality. But if you go uh, through different publications and pay attention to this uh, methodology methods and uh, methods used and software used, probably you will see if the authors discuss that, usually it is not just one specific tool. So usually it is some sort of combinations, but quite popular it is combination of a couple of tools. So mm -hmm. uh, if it is about data preprocessing, as I mentioned, we did it in Python. I think we, with such a complicated data set that we got from uh, Web of Science, uh, we are not finished with this algorithm because uh, quite quite a significant proportion of data cleaning was done after that manually because there was still some mismatches that we didn't manage to do in Python. Uh, if you work with uh, PIEC, for example, so if you retrieve data as plain text, you need you will need uh, was to PIEC. Uh, so this module plus PIEC together. Or maybe it is possible to do to use something else to prepare data. For example, uh, it is possible to upload those files in Voice Viewer and then to save them in their format for PIEC. So here you will skip this uh, step with the uh, VOS to PIEC and just save the files with the necessary extension, which could be used in PIEC without VOS to PIEC. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Well, then I think uh, if we are done, yes, um, we are done with the questions. Thank you very much, everyone. And here we finalize today the series of our summer seminars. Quite, quite a heavy summer, was it? And uh, we welcome you at our regular scientific seminars. Yes, we will publish information as soon as we get the schedule. So we'll be back to our seminars um, in September, I think, yes. So we don't have the schedule, but pretty soon we'll have that. Thank you very much, everyone.